This is the land of Don Quixote and Sancho, the land of vast skyscapes and vast acreages of vineyards and olive groves. But not many people come here, you know, on holiday, but I do. And instead of having an old nag like Don Quixote had, I've got my own 178-seater bus called Julia. And Clive and I, who's my sort of Sancho, are going to take you on a magical mystery gastronomical tour to discover the lovely things like the Manchego cheese, which is made from sheep's milk and unique to this region. Like the wonderfully drinkable light red wine. Do you know that over 80% of Spain's wine comes from this region? And joy drinker it is too. And these wonderful little things, aubergines, pickled in olive oil, vinegar and pimento. Absolutely scrumptious. So, why don't you come with me, and Clive will take the pictures, and discover some of the wonderful dishes around here, the partridge, the estofada, and the pista manchega. Oh, I'm not, that's the name of a dish. Wine in Spain comes mainly from the plain. Oh, yes, it does. It really does. <clears throat> and most of it, the gastronauts, comes from the Aran grape, the most common in La Mancha. Now, my director loves vineyards and grapes and grape pickers, especially if they have long, flowing raven hair, and asked him of hip. Anyway, he said, stop the coach and see if they'd like some lunch. Anyway, I shot into the local supermarket and bought a few ingredients, chatted to a few bar owners, and came up with a classic dish of La Mancha, which is called Estafada de Patatas, stew of potatoes. But in fact, it has more than just potatoes in. So often, as with Spanish cooking, it has tomatoes and peppers. In fact, Clive, why don't we spin round the ingredients and show the viewers exactly what we've got? So down here, if you would, please, to first of all, our finely chopped red and green peppers, over to here to some lovely sliced potatoes, some little cubes of meat, which I've already fried in olive oil and garlic, a load of tomatoes, and underneath there, back up to me when you've looked at it, under there I've got some meat stock. Anyway, we've also got, Clive, back over here, obviously some olive oil, salt, pepper, lots of garlic, and because, and that's a grape tractor just starting up behind us, they are actually picking grapes here at the moment, so we have to let them carry on with their work, but the whole essence of La Mancha really can be summed up in this little box here, difficult to see, but it is the fabulous and expensive saffron. And on the 23rd of September each year, thousands of children and mothers and fathers and uncles and aunties and grandparents go around the place picking little stamen from the crocuses, or the croci, in case you didn't know where saffron came. Anyway, that's enough wittering for me. Let's do some cooking. Here, Clive, already in the pan with some lovely Spanish olive oil, some finely chopped onions. OK, turn to their golden brown. Then we add our red and green peppers that. This isn't getting the usual sizzling effect you'd hope for. We are in the middle of a field and the wind is blowing the, gla the gas and it's cooking very intermittently underneath there. Anyway, we put those in. Then we add our tomatoes, which have all been peeled and cut up into small cubes. And we sweat that right down for about 20 minutes till we just have a lovely, smooth, rich pepper, tomato and onion paste. OK, big fat close-up on that, please, Clive. Now, the Aran grape is quite unprepossessing. In fact, the wine snobs, I'm sorry, the wine experts, haven't even heard of it. But this robust grape produces the most drinkable, light, fruity red wine. Not only can you cough it with fish or fowl, it's not expensive. Senor, una vino mas, por favor. And thanks, Oscar Clark, for telling me about it. Yeah, Riocas are great, I know, but it really is pleasing to find something so drinkable that won't break the bank. Anyone can enjoy this one. Anyway, about 15 minutes have gone by. The peppers and the tomatoes are sweated down beautifully, and it's time for a little slurp of the old Val de Peñas. Very nice stuff indeed. Anyway, Clive, back over here, please. See, they're beautifully soft now. All the unnecessary moisture has gone out of them, and it's time to add the other ingredients. You can stay there if you like, old bean, actually. Because we'll add the bits of pre-fried meat, beef in this instance. You could use pork if you wanted to. You could use veal if you so like it. That goes into there. Then we have a load of garlic. OK, stir all that in. Then, as I said, the most important part of this dish in many ways is, in fact, the potatoes, which 
were harvested just up the road from here yesterday, as a matter of fact. They're cold, raw, peeled with their water straight into there, like so. Then a bit of this lovely stock, just a bit of beef stock to cover the potatoes, because this is, as I say, a potato soup. It's not a beef stew. Okay, and then the lovely, luxurious bit, as much of this as you can possibly afford to put in the saffron. Because when this dish is finished, it should actually reflect the, the colours, the rust reds and the ochre of the La Mancha landscape. And there we are, that's in its fairly raw state. The lid needs to go on, it needs to cook for about 40 minutes now. And the next time you see it, it'll be in the hands of smiling but hungry grape pickers. Right, lid on, where's the lid? There it is. I cook in these absurd locations and sometimes I'm not always 100% proud of the result, but this dish I'm really pleased with. It does reflect the area, the wonderful flavours of saffron, peppers, garlic, beef and potatoes, and it's substantial, wholesome and wonderful. I hate these sequences where I have to serve it up. Even after all these years, I still get very nervous. And I'm quite convinced, because this was and is a spontaneous gesture on our part, these people think we're playing a joke on them. After all, how often does this happen? An Englishman arrives in the middle of nowhere from a great big coach and offers to cook them lunch in the middle of a vineyard. They must think I'm barking mad. But you know, it made them laugh. And if a good, honest plate full of food can put a smile on someone's face, then it can't be bad. In fact, although they regarded me as mad Englishmen, they really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Except, of course, I didn't use enough salt, and they preferred the gravy or the sauce to be drier, and while we're at it, they thought I'd been a bit mean with the spices. But they all came back for seconds. They really did. They did. They really did. So, like Don Quixote, it's onwards, ever onwards, in my faithful autobus, Julia. This time to cook for a member of the Spanish aristocracy, the Marquis of Grignon, and his dog, Spotty. You know, through my journey through La Mancha, people have been talking to me about the great speciality of Toledo, partridge Toledo style. So when I eventually got to Toledo, I went around the restaurants looking for this classic regional local dish. And when I had it for lunch today, to be quite frank, I was a little disappointed because they'd merely cooked it, it seemed to me, in a little water, a few onions and a couple of potatoes. And it struck me as not quite the thing to do to such a celebrated bird as the partridge. So I got on the dog and bone, the phone, contacted my new chum, the Marcus of Grignon, and said, can I borrow your wonderful estate and do the real thing? He said, yes, here I am. This is, back up to me a bit, please, Clive. This is the real thing. This is the lovely red-legged partridge, OK? Very typical of this region, and they exist in their hundreds, if they're not their thousands. Anyway, one of the big problems with cooking sketches is time marches on and oil burns. So before I explain what the ingredients are, if I may, I'll just chuck these onions into the pot so they can sizzle away to get us ahead of the game. Right, now, Clive, the ingredients. Quite simply, some partridges, plucked, drawn and cut in half, a couple of bay leaves and some cloves, some garlic, some flour, some stock, some white wine, some vinegar, and this I see you linger on is, yes, it's chocolate, because we ultimately thicken the sauce with some chocolate, which wouldn't have happened here, of course, before Christopher Columbus discovered America and brought back some of these new things from the new world to the old. Anyway, next thing we must do is put our partridges in there and brown them off really nicely in very hot oil, along with the garlic. Another one in. You know, they pile the pressure onto me on these programmes sometimes. I was just worrying about getting it nicely golden brown when they whispered to me that the Marquis is, in fact, the president of the Spanish Gastronomic Society. That's really helpful, isn't it? So I must make sure that this is super-duper. Right, those are nicely browned now. So we put the rest of the ingredients in. Firstly, little black pepper. And sap. Season it nicely. Then we make a very light roux with some flour into the olive oil 
and onion. Small amount like that. Now, I haven't, back up to me, please, Clive. I haven't added any salt because I'm using stock from a little packet, so I didn't have time to make any. And stock packet is sometimes a little bit on the salty side. However, a little bit of chicken stock into there like that. Then about a glass of dry white wine, like so. Now, a touch from the Arabs, I suppose, a couple of cloves go into the pot and a couple of bay leaves. OK, and a dash of wine vinegar. Now, that's all we do for the time being. We let that simmer gently away in its own juices for about 45 minutes or until the birds are tender. And finally, we thicken it with the grated chocolate. Anyway, so there's nothing more I can do for the time being. Yes, I can. I can have a slurp and we can prepare ourselves one of those little historical sketches, you know, about the Marquis having come here with his family, not he himself, of course, but his antecedents in the 13th century. And we'll work out how we do that once we've read the guidebook. Ah, yes, it says here, the Marquis has lived here, or rather his family have, since the days of El Cid. He now grows Cabernet Sauvignon and picks them at the very last minute, capturing all the maturity of the grape, not to mention the alcohol. It's very nice, the alcohol. OK, the sauce is beautifully reduced. The partridges are golden, slightly tender, I hope. And I take them out, put them onto this plate. OK, a couple of those. And then we finish off the sauce for the final thing. Three bits, four bits. Right, Clive, now back into this pot, please. Because this is the bit, and just before I put this in, back up to me, old chap, I have never, ever before in my life made partridge with chocolate sauce for a Marquis especially one who happens to be the president of the Spanish Gastronomic Society. So my life is really in his hands because I don't take any prisoners around here. Anyway, so we stir the chocolate in. Now, Marquis or no Marquis, I'm going to have to taste this with my fingers because... Hey, oh. Let's hope we're of one mind because this strikes me as amazing. And the sauce, big, fat, loving close-up on this, Clive, please. The sauce over the partridge, that rich, dark sauce. There. A loving close-up, and the next time you see it, we'll be either laughing and enjoying ourselves, or we'll be looking stony-faced at me. Oh, see, get down. What do you think? Excellent. Truly? <laughs> You've done very well because this is something I eat very often here. Yeah. But do you, do you usually have it with a slightly chocolate-flavoured sauce? Not Certainly not. This is a new idea, and we're, of course, going to put it into use in the future. <laughs> Tell me, what are the main influences of the food here in La Mancha? It's a vast area, isn't it? Mm -hmm. La Mancha, of course, game is very important. See, get down. It's a very good um, area for partridges, which we're eating, for hare rabbit, and then from deer and wild boars. So I would say, of course, cheese is also a very important uh, element, manchego cheese, which comes from sheep. And, uh, uh, of course, oil, wine, uh, are major ingredients of the gastronomy of central Spain. It's very simple food, but uh, I, I like it, uh, and I think it's very healthy, though. It's, it's, yes, it is said that even though the Spanish sort of drink a lot and smoke a lot, because they eat so much fish and so much olive oil, they have um, one of the lowest heart attack rates in the world, which is very pleasing, isn't it? In fact, um, what they call the Mediterranean diet, which is what you eat mostly in Spain, which is basically oil cooking and a variety of... of, of I think the great thing about Mediterranean food is it's very varied. So actually you take an intake of most of the major... Um, vitamins and uh, elements. And they say now that it's the, the most uh, balanced diet in the world. Mm. Doctors are recommending it in all over the place, including America. You're looking certainly very healthy, right? Tell me about your wine that you make here. It's the first time I've I found the sight of these windmills awe-inspiring. And maybe Cervantes, Spain's most famous writer, could well have laid eyes on these very windmills himself. He never set out to be a writer. He was a soldier who was wounded, so he turned to writing to make a living. He was probably on his way home after a particularly agreeable time in the local bodega. 
Having consumed the odd glass of Tinto, he decided that if you close one eye and squint, then these windmills do in fact look like a lot of giants. And so the famous Don Quixote and his wonderful search for chivalry in a world of changing values was born. Well, just a thought. Toledo, the old capital of Spain. And today it's still a fine monument to Arab architects. It was renowned for religious tolerance, where Jews, Arabs and Christians have lived for centuries, worshipped and worked in harmony. It wasn't like that in the olden days, though. Much of Toledo's history is drenched in Spanish blood. But more of that later. To cook my lunch today, I've borrowed the corner of a very busy restaurant kitchen. It's one of the classic dishes I want to cook today, a salt cod fish stew. Now, Clive, they want me out before midday because they have to serve lots of people. Quick spin round the ingredients, please. First of all, with the salted cod, OK, which I've had soaked in water overnight to take most of the salt away from it. Over here, some spinach, some chickpeas, which have been soaked in water overnight and then partly boiled, some potatoes, some very important things here, some fried croutons of bread and some garlic, and over to this way a little bit, and some saffron, because, Clive, back up to me if you would, we go back to this very important Spanish thing, the picata, this pestle and mortar job where they use things like almonds and olive oil and garlic, or in this case, bread, garlic and saffron to make a paste to thicken the sauce. So, close up in here, I've been working at this for some time now, it's just toasted or fried bread, crushed garlic, olive oil and a load of saffron. And that just gets pounded and pounded away till we have a wonderful paste, OK? Well, you could watch that for hours, I haven't got the time to do it for hours and hours because I must get on with the dish. So we'll take the chickpeas over to this side here where we have a pot full of olive oil. Some chickpeas in. Stay there and I'll bring the cod over. Then we pop in some salt cod. we we'll soak that very lightly in the olive oil with the chickpeas. Similarly, we bring in some lovely spinach and pop that in. Like so. Stay with it, Clive. Okay. Then some potatoes. It's very important, back up to me just for a second, it's very important to realise that it's sometimes a bit difficult to do these things. As I said at the beginning of the piece, they are genuinely trying to get their lunch together and they're all looking at me curiously, wondering what is this strange Englishman doing with our national heritage. Anyway, I'm doing my best. Into that, there's the gas. We then add a little water. Now, at the moment, that looks about as attractive as a National Health Service Friday cod meal for someone on a very serious diet, doesn't it? But the thing that will change it, the thing which will bring the sunshine into it, is the piccata. Now, this is the piccata. Oh, and this is also extremely heavy. Right, it's the saffron the garlic, the olive oil, and the toasted bread. Almost at once, the colours begin to change. And now, as that simmers away for about 25 minutes until the potatoes are cooked, until the cod is nicely and firmly, subtly fleshy, it'll turn into a rich, golden stew. The cooks are making lunch, and this is a stew made with brawn. Oh, and this with beef stock and bread and loads of garlic and it's served with an egg. It's good to see that old peasanty dishes like these have a place in the kitchens of Toledo's top hotel. Anyway, my dish turned out beautifully. It reflected, I think, all the colours of Toledo's rooftops, ochre, yellow and brown, and it smelt divine. A veritable Toledo on a plate. Absolutely delicious. Now, children, we know what the Romans did for Spain. They brought olives, garlic and wine. But what did the Arabs do for Spain? They brought us rice. Yeah, rice. Yes. yes, rice, fair enough. Without that, there'll be no paella. Citrus fruit. Yeah, oranges and lemons. Yeah, citrus fruit. Yes, well, that's the way you can have your salt cod and lemon and orange salad as an hors d'oeuvre, yes. Almonds? Almonds? The almonds. Yes, lamb with the almond sauce, that's right, yes. And uh, cumin. cumin. And cumin, yes, cumin. exactly correct, to flavour some of the slightly curry type sauces they have in this country. Spinach? Yes, spinach. spinach. Indeed, yes. Spinach, which is part of this wonderful dish I've cooked today. But, who gave us saffron, the very essence of the colours of Spain and the colours of this dish? Mm. Uh, I don't know. Mm. No, it was the Phoenicians. God, who'd have thought it, the Phoenicians, eh? Clever dick. 
I know. I thought it was the Greeks. Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then I shall begin. Once upon a time, the Caliph who ruled Spain was getting really cross with the Christians who kept threatening his position, his power and his place. So, to get rid of them, he invited them, 5,000 of them, to dinner. But instead of giving them grouse on the lovely tables of the castle, he dug a big trench, chopped off their heads and buried them. And that was the end of his problem with the Christians. At least, that's what it said in the boys' bumper book of Spanish history. Anyway, from the old capital Toledo to Madrid. Now, a little confession here. Call me a silly old chump if you want, but I'm not really all that impressed by capital cities. And as a cook, I find it extremely hard to find a gastronomic thumbprint here. So I thought, to give you, the viewer, an impression of what the successful Spaniard would consume in the course of a normal working day, I'd run through the basic things. You know, breakfast, lunch and dinner, of course. Fiestas are a bit different. And so, breakfast. Basically, there are two kinds of breakfast. There's the international hotel stuff, eggs fried at four o'clock in the morning and flabby bacon, or there's the real Spanish breakfast. A real Spanish breakfast can be something sweet, like churros, with hot coffee or hot chocolate, or, much more to my taste indeed, is the savoury breakfast. Fresh bread spread with garlic, olive oil and tomato and salt, and munched down with a refreshing glass of chilled red wine. No better way to start the day. Go back to work after this wonderful breakfast, tippity tap tap, plant a few trees or dig a few rows, sell a few hats, and then it's time for elevenses. <laughs> and elevenses, well, after a hard morning in the office, they could be anything you fancy. Potatoes bravas, potatoes in mayonnaise, calamares, some simple bread, some octopus, or because I've had a very difficult morning, really backing it out on the tight right and the air conditioning went down, I'm going to have some little boccarones, little fillets of fish marinated in olive oil and vinegar. Washed down with a refreshing glass of chilled vermouth. And you know, it's nearly lunchtime. No, 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 this isn't exactly lunch quite yet, because you see, in Madrid and throughout Spain, just before lunch, they pop out for a little aperitif and a tapas. This is a changuru. It comes from the Basque country, and it's a wonderful, wonderful crab baked in tomato sauce. And a little bit of paella, which can come from Valencia, the Costa Blanca. And just to rear an appetite up, a little fresh prawn in vinaigrette. And because it now is almost lunchtime, and that's quarter to two in Spain, by the way, not 12 o'clock like it is in France or one o'clock like it is in England. It's about two o'clock lunchtime. A little sip of chilled fino, a little drop of sherry to get the taste buds really going because it's lunch. And then, of course, after lunch, there's not exactly more work. It's called a siesta. Salted pilchers, a gastronomic link that goes back possibly to the days of the Armada, when, of course, salting was one of the only ways of preserving food. But even 400 miles inland, you can find the freshest of fish landed overnight and loaded onto fast trains. It arrives at dawn, sparkly-eyed, silver of fin, and piping fresh. Here in Madrid, what is so exciting for me is that all the threads of Spanish gastronomy come to the center of Spain, the heart of Spain. I could have had, for example, octopus Galician style, salt cod Biscayan style, fried fish assorted and Galician style. Marinated clams, I could have had treeps or tripe, Madrid style. I could have had roast suckling pig, Segovia style. What I decided not to have, however, was the Manitas de Cordero con Rapa y Ostras, which is simply pig's trotters with oysters and monkfish. And I settled instead for a lobster. And quite wonderful it was too. I wouldn't, of course, eat vast amounts like this if I was at home, but the Spanish really do go for it in a major way. And there is talk, very silly talk, of doing away with the tradition of the siesta. Well, I think the siesta is a wonderful idea, one that the whole of the European community should embrace warmly. It makes me a much happier person dreaming of great dishes of steaming paellas, hake in piquant sauce, clams in wine and parsley, the stuff dreams are made of. What a day it's been, my little gastronauts. My liver has been immersed in the real Spanish way of life, from the bread and olive oil at breakfast time, through to the tapas, through to the lunch, to the afternoon snooze, the tapas before dinner, and now dinner. A very simple look up this clive, a very simple, crispy, crunchy roast suckling pig, and very delicious indeed it is. Now, 
You might think, I have a wonderful life. Well, of course I do. And it's great to visit capital cities, Paris, Madrid, doesn't matter where it is. But it isn't the place where you get the real inspiration from, because you never have enough time. You're a visiting gastronaut, flying in, dropping in, eating, and going away again. And although it's been a wonderful experience, I'm going to creep off somewhere into some sleepy, dusty Spanish village out there in the back of beyond and find a little place where I can create what I think. Now that I've been in Madrid for a day, what I think Spain is all about. And so, for my final cooking sketch, I took inspiration from this family, who are spending the day cooking with friends, playing cards and talking about old times, doing really the same thing their grandparents did, and probably cooking the same dish, pisto manchego, stewed peppers, tomatoes and onions. In these brilliant mini-breaks, sometimes there's a little sadness when you have to say goodbye, not only to people, but to things, like this lovely old thing here, Julia, my bus, which has brought me from Malaga virtually to Madrid. So, what I'm going to do, is cook a little snack for the driver. Now, this is a dish, a very simple dish, come down here, Clive, and have a look, which involves cubes of stale bread soaked in water, dipped in paprika, which have then been fried in garlic-flavoured olive oil. OK, it also has chopped mountain ham, it has fresh farmhouse eggs, little, little bits of fried bacon, and some fried onion and garlic. Now, that got to be very simple, you might say. Very simple indeed, indeed it is. It's a dish which comes from Andalusia and is well known throughout Spain. But the secret of it is, is getting it all tossed up nicely in some lovely olive oil. So the onions go in first, like so, and they've all been, already been fried a little bit. A little bit of bacon, like that. A little bit of mountain ham. OK, quickly shirred round like that, as the Americans might say. Then you toss in your cubes of bread. And of course, it's at this stage that the bread takes on the flavour of the ham, the garlic, the paprika and the bacon. Right, now that is all but it. Simple, you might say. It is very simple. OK, that's the base of it. But then there's the tricky bit, the bit of frying the eggs. And in seven years, you know, I've never fried an egg on TV. Huh, let's see what happens. Clive, big close up here, please. Hot oil. One egg. Two eggs. Now, back up to me a second. My chum, Albert Roux, when he interviews aspiring young cook, doesn't give him a long, lengthy discussion and lots of questions and answers. He simply says, could you fry me an egg, please? And if they take the egg carefully, break it open carefully, and do their very best to cook it well, he hires them. If they think, well, an egg's an egg, any fool can cook that and throw it in the pan, they don't get past the kitchen door. Simple, isn't it? Anyway, here we are. Eggs nearly ready. Lovely, good Spanish olive oil all over them. I don't know how Raphael likes his eggs. I'm going to assume he likes them slightly slightly underdone. Right, so to complete the dish, lovely fried eggs on top of the croutons in paprika and the bits of bacon, the ham, the garlic and that whole stuff. Right now, Clive, can you come with me, because I'm going to surprise our poor old driver and ask him if he could face eating a spot of this. Raphael, have a go at that. Oh. I hope you like it. Actually, I hate these bits Ooh. where I have to give food I've cooked to strangers. Qué bueno. Bueno, sí. Well, authentico? Authentico. Authentico, de verdad. Oh, I seem to have cracked it. I'll trot along, then. <laughs> to celebrate the end of this wonderful journey, I could have cooked the most extravagant dish. But I know that the Spanish friends, cooks, waiters, barons and bouncers that I've met would really approve of this simple dish. I dedicate it to them. Mm -hmm.